Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? We're gonna get back to some Spawn comics now, and back to the biggest mystery of 1993 with Who Killed Al Simmons? We're taking a look at Spawn number 12, so just before we get into it, if you enjoy the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, go subscribe on my Patreon. Gives you early access to everything I do, helps the channel, and helps to buy new comics. So, yeah, okay, Spawn number 12. I don't know if you guys remember this. Um, I feel like Todd was semi-successful in hyping up the Who Killed Al Simmons thing. Like, not very much. I wouldn't go so far as to call it an event or anything. But he created this unlikable character and held on for an entire year before he set about revealing the great mystery that nobody had really asked about. Nobody cared who killed Spawn. Come on. But we're building a universe here. We're building a mythos, right? We want to try and interlock these books together until we don't because of legal ramifications. I wonder if Chapel having killed Spawn still comes up in continuity. I bet you it does. Like, often. And then whoever currently owns Youngblood steps in and issues a cease and desist. Because no one's allowed to make Youngblood content anymore. That's not how it goes. Alright, so let's get started on this. We'll start with the cover. That's an okay cover. It's recognizable. It's also extremely easy. I don't think Todd spent any real time on this. But yeah, like I said, there's no mistaking which issue this is. At least, which is, which is nice to see in a Spawn comic. So many of them are just him leaping against the fucking sky or whatever. A little bit like this. All right, so story and art by Todd McFarlane. We are past the Creator's Choice series. I want to say that's what it was called. The thing where uh, Todd hired a bunch of writers and then didn't pay the litigious one properly. That turned out real well. Okay, so this is flashback. Ugh, okay. And fuck you, Todd. Every fucking time... You open up a Spawn comic, it feels like. You get this wall of text. And Todd's a shit writer, but that's not going to stop him from just tapping away forever. And all of it is... It, it, I mean, it's kind of nothing, really. It's not even really recap. There's a little bit of stuff in here about how Al Simmons is Spawn. And he was chosen as Spawn because he was morally pliable. And he came back for love. And that's crazy, right? And Todd didn't have to work too hard on this first page, either. Take it a little bit of shortcuts here. Kind of a nice moon, though. I like how that turned out. Okay, that's a bit more like it. Although the vertical double page splash can go fuck itself, but... Okay, a uh, bunch more talking. Yeah, da, 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 about how Spawn doesn't remember things. But he keeps wanting to come back to this church, probably because Todd likes drawing Spawn sitting on top of a cross. It's a cool shot, cool perspective, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this doesn't feel like the kind of double-page splash that Liefeld will do, where it feels like he actually drew it on a single comic board and then just flipped it sideways. Yeah, that's some good stuff, and more detail than Todd usually puts in his covers. Oh, we're... Oh, okay, so this is why it's called Flashback. It's one of these fucking issues where Spawn just stands around doing a Spawn pout in low-res profile. I do find it a little funny that... Uh, I. I don't remember where I saw it recently. I saw it in something where early in Liefeld's career, he was raving about Mike Mignola and how he was really digging that style. And Todd told him, you don't want to get into that shit because you don't want that influencing your style. That style's not going to make any money. What you want to do is throw in a whole bunch of detail on everything. And then in his actual comic, you know, he has to go out of his way to do as little detail as possible. I mean, you know, it's obvious why. In addition to the drawing, the inking, the writing, he's also trying to, you know, start up an empire. He's starting to build a toy company. He's trying to get a spawn mobile on the road. That guy's got shit to do. He can't be drawn all the time. Never mind the fact that that's all anybody really wants from him. But I mean, you know, the, the dude is rich like very few people in comics now because of it. So it's hard to fault him. It's just that his comics kind of fucking suck. That wasn't a tangent, was it? That was all on, that was on course? It must have been on course. So we're flashing back to Al and Wanda's wedding. Again, just kind of a funny thing to notice. Uh, you know, Todd went out of his way to make Spawn black and to point it out, that, you know, this is a black superhero, but never learned how to draw black hair. Anyway, at the wedding was Grandma Blake. So that would be uh, Wanda's grandma, I guess. And she's all blind and shit and wise and her and Al get along great. And also at the wedding was Terry, his, his good friend Terry. He doesn't look anything like this. 
but that's okay. And Spawn is getting very close to emo mode, where he's beating himself up about how Terry and Wanda are, are, are well, married behind his back. And you just know that he's like seconds away from just letting off a fireworks display. All right, so cutting to Washington, D.C., the office of Jason Wynn at the CIA. I'm trying to think if we've seen Jason Wynn before this in the context of Spawn. I feel like probably in Youngblood Strike File, although that might not even have come out yet. I'm not even sure. But it feels like that should have come out before now. Anyway, Jason Wynn, uh, was, he was the head of the CIA, I guess, or at least he was the boss of Al Simmons and Chapel when they were covert operatives working for him. And he was the one who decided that Al Simmons was getting too altruistic, I think. Altruistic? Huh? And needed to be gotten rid of. And what they're doing here, actually, is they're reacting to um, the files that have been stolen and the weapons that have been stolen by Spawn. And they're trying to figure out who might have been responsible for all this. And the only person that really fits the bill is actually Terry. I guess he was a spe spec ops guy, too. You know, Al would fit the bill, but he's dead. They're not going to consider him a suspect. So they figure it must be Terry because him and Wanda want revenge for what happened to Al. So they're, they figure they're gathering evidence to use against them, which is um, an interesting idea for a little subplot. We're going to see it's, it's going to be handled pretty poorly, but I do like the twist. I, I like the logic involved where Spawn was, you know, doing a thing to help him short term, but not thinking about the long term consequences. That's pretty good. So what they're going to do is they're going to send some people around to Terry's place uh, to intimidate him. And that's about all. And some kind of easy pages. Not a ton of detail, but like, you know, would you even want it on these pages? I don't know. This is, this is pretty boring stuff to have to read. Which does kind of sum up Spawn a lot of the time, I have to say. All right, so from here we're going to cut to uh, Grandma Blake's house, where she's still kicking. Uh, she's a fair bit older and wrinklier and, you know, white hair and all that. Looks like a decent version, like an older version of the character we just saw. And Al's going to come and visit her. He doesn't really have a good reason to do this other than, you know, like he keeps beating himself up about Wanda. So this is all just a matter of trying to delay the next fireworks display. It's like the, it's like LCD in the uh, Wolverine comic. It's going to go off eventually. But we're just trying to, you know, kick it down the road a little bit. So anyway, he's talking to Grandma Blake and he tells her that, you know, there is an afterlife. She's going to go to heaven, which is not really something he knows because he doesn't know what the fuck happens in heaven if there is a heaven. And the only real question he asks is if Wanda still thinks about him. And Grandma Blake says, of course she does. Uh, she thinks about you all the time. And that's that's it. Um, I guess, you know, that that diffused the timer for a bit so Spawn can walk away without having depleted his meter anymore. And we wasted two pages on this. Did anybody care about this two pages? Todd cared, I suppose. But yeah, man, that's a whole waste of time. That, we didn't learn anything from that. Nothing got revealed. If Grandma Blake ends up being a pivotal character later on, I suppose that's something. I don't think she does, but, you know, I could be wrong. The Spawn comic doesn't seem to be particularly imaginative. Like, every time I look up some kind of, you know, highlights or whatever, uh, it's always Violator or Anti-Spawn or angels, or demons, or gangsters, which was all stuff that was established, like, in the first, I don't know, 18 issues? All right, so we're going to get another Talking Heads page. Todd loves doing these. They save so much time, except for all the writing he has to do. This is the thing, right? You could be drawing with all that time. Okay, so CNN is talking about a gang war that seems to be heating up. The shock jock opinion guy basically just says, good, I hope they kill each other. In my day, we settled things by punching. And the entertainment reporter is talking about the uh, the film rights to the Al Simmons story. And apparently he actually gets breaking news as they receive word that Youngblood's Bedrock has run into some legal snags with animators Hanna-Barbera over name use rights. So that's kind of funny. I don't mind that too much. I, I don't know about the breaking news aspect of it, but, you know, why not? So then we're going to cut to uh, Sam and Twitch. Why not? They're not going to do a whole lot, but, you know, we got to get through this issue somehow. So Sam and Twitch have been put on probation because Billy Kincaid's corpse ended up in their office. 
And obviously they didn't do it, but they can't do anything about this. So Sam is going to, you know, he's going to rant and rave while Twitch is the voice of reason. This is a bit of a nicer page. I like this uh, this background element here, how it carries through the panels and, you know, the extreme Dutch angle and everything. And, you know, uh, Todd just always does these buildings kind of effortlessly. Yeah, this is all right for a nothing page anyway, for, like for nothing happening. And really just kind of carrying through it, uh, Twitch is talking about how at least they didn't do anything. So the investigation that's going on with these guys isn't going to find anything. So they don't have to worry about that. Unless, of course, something got planted by somebody like, say, Jason Wynn. But I don't think that actually happens. I mean, he wouldn't really have a reason to do that, I suppose. So, yeah, that's fine. Uh, they do bring up Spawn because he was sighted at Billy Kincaid's house the last time Billy Kincaid was seen alive, anyway. And Sam is going to very sarcastically put on a happy face and, uh, you know, grin and bear it. And, and pretty easy page all the way through. Again, except for all that typing time, because... Jesus, man, like, look at all this shit. And again, nothing is being revealed to us. Nothing, there's no development of any kind. I, I guess it, it's a little bit of a fun exchange. Eh, except that it's so fucking bloated. God forbid any of these guys hire an editor. Does he have an editor in this? Like, or someone he calls an editor, Tom or Zachowski? Sure. So he's he's just looking for typos. Seeing as how he's the one who would make them anyway, essentially, or he's the one who would correct them. Then, yeah, sure, why, you can be the editor. Why not? Okay, so now we're going to cut to Wanda and Cyan because Todd wants to let us know that he has the cutest two-year-old in the world. These are the things two-year-olds say. They say nope. They say chess. They say juice. When they're supposed to talk nice, they say peas. Isn't that great, you guys? Isn't it, Aren't babies just the best? And it's like, you know you're marketing this thing to fucking 13-year-olds, right? And then they uh, they arrive home, basically. And uh, Terry's waiting for them, and they're all super happy because they're a super happy family. Terry's got his government job, and Wanda does whatever she does, and they have the cutest kid in the world. And isn't it great how two-year-olds don't say daddy, they say dad tea? That's the cutest thing ever. My 12-year-old demographic will love that. And we get an insert poster by Rob Liefeld. I think this was the one that was supposed to show up in, like, issue 10? Maybe even 9. No, I think it was 10. That's right. It's, it's a Blood Wolf poster. So, he had to wait two extra months to get that. Are you not thrilled? <laughs> and, of course, very on brand of Liefeld. Everybody else is going to, you know, when they do a poster for Todd, they're going to do the Todd characters. Liefeld goes, I got a Lobo ripoff for you. So, the happiest family in the world gets home, and there's a couple of CIA agents waiting for them on the doorstep. Want to take Cyan inside? And the CIA guys go, that's a real nice family you got. Be a shame if something happened to them. Because we couldn't come up with anything more than the most cliched thing possible for them to say in this situation. And Jason Wynn is just tickled when he hears about this. And the CIA is going to start round-the-clock surveillance on both him and his wife. So Terry will no longer be the happiest man in the world despite having the cutest child in the world. These are the burdens God gives us. So then we're going to cut to Spawn. Remember that guy? And him and all the bums are huddled around a fire, uh, singing the Flintstones theme song and passing around the ripple. And this feels like some kind of shot Todd's trying to take. I feel like it might be, because it feels like if Todd's not starting shit, Todd just isn't happy. But just so that it doesn't start too much shit, he does put in the uh, Hanna-Barbera copyright notice in here. So as a result of Spawn's actions, Wanda and Terry's family life is about to be severely fucked up. Sam and Twitch have been put on probation, and he just doesn't notice because he's too busy getting drunk in an alley with the bums. Which is vaguely interesting. And we get, like, stream of consciousness conversation about singing the Fred and Barney song again. And I used to love Dino. And screw Dino, he's a pussy. But T-Rex in Jurassic Park, they, they say that's the real thing. I guess this Jurassic Park had just come out. And then from there, we move on to Bobby's Jurassic Farts, which gets all the bums laughing. And then they stop. And then somebody belches. And then they start laughing again. And then one of the bums, named Garib, is off peeing. And then on his way back to the group, he sees Spawn's mask and puts it on as a joke. Only the mask doesn't like Garib. None of us like Garib. And the mask tries to choke Garib out. And Spawn has to yank it off his head. 
And Garib said, wow, that was almost as bad as being around one of Bobby's Jurassic farts, which is actually kind of funny as far as uh, callback humor goes. And Spawn has had enough merriment for one night. It's time to go emo again. So he goes, oh my god, you guys, it's not funny. I can't remember things and I don't know how to do any of this. Jesus Christ. I'm going to go back and mope in my room. Terrible fucking hand. Like, Todd has problems with hands sometimes, but like, yeesh. Like, try a little harder, Todd. Come on. And then, out of nowhere, uh, Spawn has a flashback, as, as the title foretold. And he kind of pieces it together that he keeps thinking about the skull and the coffin and the flag. And wait a minute, that's my death. And that's also my killer. And the cross. It's not just that I'm drawn to churches because Todd likes drawing me on a steeple. It's all chapel! And we actually got a cool page to end on. How often does that happen in these? Like, that's a flat-out poster. That's some great shit. And we get a bit of a tale here about how uh, issue number 11 was finished up. That was the Frank Miller issue. So apparently uh, there was an Image Comics meeting that started at 10 o'clock at night and lasted until 4 in the morning, and Todd still had three pages to finish. So while haggling things out and telling jokes and having a good time, we passed the three pages around Rob Liefeld's living room, each taking a crack at it. So this was apparently Rob, Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri, and Todd in Rob's living room. Uh, Eric was in New York, and Valentino says he's no longer an inker, which, I mean, I agree. The first Shadowhawk series was pretty bad for the inks. All right, a whole bunch of pinups. Always a lot of uh, fan art in these. I know a couple of these have been from guys who watch the videos, <laughs> who watch my videos, which is, I, I don't think I recognize any of these names here, but most of you guys got handles, so I wouldn't recognize you anyway. All right. Oh, we're on to Wizard 27 already, eh? Shit. Okay, so that's it for Spawn number 12. That issue sucked. That was a whole lot of tap dancing and just kind of soft shoeing for like 20 pages until we could get to the last two and a bit. Because that you have to have the reveal at the end of the book. You can't put it at the beginning of the next book. That doesn't make any sense. You can't put it halfway through the book. It has to be a two-parter. At least. If Todd could plot events, maybe you could actually make it like three or four, but that's not going to happen. We did get the bit with Terry, uh, like the start of the schism between Terry and the CIA. So that's something. I think that's that's everything, actually. And the rest of it was lame. It was just Todd, you know, tapping away at his keyboard, bloviating for page after page, and then doing some pretty quick pages to back him up. When he was doing the issues for the other writers, he was going pretty hard at those pages. So it could be he's behind schedule now. That would make some sense, and we're not too far off from Greg Capullo having to do some fill-in issues. So I am kind of interested in eventually getting to those issues where Todd comes back, like the, the last, what is it, like issue 19 through 25? That's the end of the, the McFarlane drawing era, like ever, apart from the odd guest spot, you know. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what those look like at some point. But for this one, that's going to do it. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. Gives you early access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and you can join the Blood Force Discord server. But yeah, that's going to do it. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.